It's showtime. People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. You know, the right to bear arms is because that's the last form of defense against tyranny. Washington is fundamentally corrupt. There are more words in the IRS code than there are in the Bible. Made in America, heard around the world. You're listening to Blunt Force Truth. I'm Chuck Woolery, along with my co-host, Mark Young, and we have a really interesting show today. I think it's going to be fascinating. We do. We're going to take a little uh, detour from some of the stuff we normally do. And uh, we have with us is uh, one of our fellow or two fellow broadcasters from Podcast One uh, who are launching a new show. So this is Megan Clarity and Jack Moore. And, and Chuck, this show is called 22 Hours of an American Nightmare. And this is about a, uh, a pretty well-known murder that happened back in, I think, 2015 in the D.C. area. And I've listened to the show. We're going to get into it. Uh, but Megan, Jack, welcome to Blunt Force Truth. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for having us. So I want to start off with what got you to do this topic? Why, why this murder? Why, why, why this? Well, you know, when this happened here in D.C. in 2015, it was just a couple blocks from the vice president's house. The firefighters, D.C. firefighters rushed to this mansion that's burning down. And at first, we all thought it was just a fire. It ends up that they find four bodies inside. One of them is a child. Um, and this thing just kept unraveling and unraveling. And basically, we started following it from that day, May, thir- May 14th, 2015, all the way through trial, which was a six-week trial, and the conviction of the man who killed this wealthy businessman and his wife, their 10-year-old son, and the family's housekeeper in their home and held them hostage for 22 hours, which is why we called the podcast 22 Hours. Hmm. Is the, now, is the podcast 22 hours long? It feels like it. No. <laughs> no I mean, when it's all done, when it's all strung together, will it be that? Is it well, in real time, so to speak? It's going to be 10 episodes, um, roughly about, you know, 35 to 40 minutes, but we're letting the content dictate how long each episode is because they each sort of have a theme. You know, there's just so many details that can be reported out of this thing from the evidence to the witness testimony to the strategy of the defense, the prosecution. Um, so we're, we're really kind of doing this in chapters almost like and, a book. And one of the things, if I could jump in um, to kind of um, go off of Megan's point, um, each of the episodes does kind of examine a different element of the case. And there's a lot to talk about, but even as, and we're still actually um, working on the podcast. We're, the first episode launches June 10th and we don't really have the ending written yet. We're still working on this. We're still hearing back from people that we've been trying to interview who maybe have been a little hesitant and, you know, we're, our phones are still ringing and we're still hearing from them. So we're, you know, rewriting things on the fly. We don't really have an ending set, but even, you know, kind of looking at our, our guidepost for where this thing is going, it's probably going to end up about 10 or 12 hours and, you know, when, when I stop and think about that, I really think, you know, that's, that's not even, or that's barely half of the time that these people were held. When you think about, yeah. you know, trying to, trying to, um, you know, really grapple with their experience and how much of a nightmare it really was. I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, each minute felt like an hour, I'm sure. I, I'll tell you what I find really interesting is, and I got, so I had the luxury of getting to hear the first episode, even though it doesn't come out till the 10th. Uh, the first thing that hits me, Chuck, is we live in this 24 seven news cycle now, right? Where it's three minutes of news that's repeated every hour. Yes. And this is so different when you listen to it because you're being, you first up, there's a theater of the mind thing going on, but you're going through the entire experience. You're not just saying, well, you know, a house burned down, four bodies were discovered and they think there's a murderer. Now you're actually getting this experience, and we don't do that today. That's something that's missing in journalism today is in-depth coverage. And, and I think you and I have talked about this in the past, that lack of, of, of depth in things. Yeah, it, it's true. And the other thing is, uh, Megan and Jack, is, is that, uh, you know, I was kind of in my mind thinking it was more like an old-time dramatization uh, of this crime that was more like done in the 40s and early 50s on radio, but, but it's really not like that at all, is it? It's not like that. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's so dramatic on its own, just the facts 
on their own will grab you. I mean, it's just, it's an unbelievable crime and it's an unbelievable story that really there are so many things unanswered questions too. So we present, um, as Mark was saying, we present it, you know, you start with the crime and then we kind of walk you through how this thing unravels and what we learn and how maybe it doesn't make sense and how it all ended up kind of tying together. But it really is a journey to the end. And and something, you know, to, um, uh, to kind of piggyback off of is in the beginning, it started with the report of a fire. So and it was in the middle of the day. And, you know, so people usually aren't sleeping in the middle of the day. And that's when, you know, when people are sleeping in the middle of the night, that's when a fire can be deadly. Right. Right. Middle of the day, people, maybe it's a chimney fire, maybe, you know, and the, so this, the podcast starts with the firefighters who we heard from, they testified at the trial. They didn't know they were going into a crime scene. So when they walked up to the front door, the front door's locked, they kicked it in. Then the whole um, house is filled with this thick black smoke. They don't know what they're going to find. They're crawling up the stairs. And, you know, so we, we do try to take the listener uh, into this experience as much as we can. And it was a, it was a change for us because we are used to daily deadlines and, you know, every day it's a new story and you do the best job that you can, but you know, tomorrow you're, you're working a different story. So this required us to really take a step back and relive every angle of this that we thought we already knew. And when we looked at this with such detail, we, we, you know, we discovered new things that we didn't know before either. Well, when they discovered it was a crime, can you tell us exactly what happened without giving away the show? Yeah, I mean, they, they found, basically, the firefighters thought they were finding people who may have been overcome by smoke. In fact, they found for four murder victims. And this is a very, very wealthy neighborhood. We're talking about a house that's worth $4 million plus, right? That's right. And it, it was, um, it actually was dubbed the DC Mansion Murders. It kind of made a, a flash, like to Mark's point, it made a flash when it first happened because of where it happened. It was just a few blocks from the vice president's house. It was a super fancy, you know, neighborhood, huge mans- mansion that one of the victims, Sava Savopoulos, was a millionaire. He had a, you know, a $700,000 sports car in the garage. I mean, it, this was not your normal wow. family. But the question was motive. Who did this? For a while, they said, it's got to be more than one person. How can you overtake four people with just one guy? And so for a while here in D.C., it was made clear to us from police that they were looking for more than one suspect. And then it ends up in the end that it, it was one man who did this. And we talk you through how, you know, the prosecution was able to prove that that was possible. But again, like a lot of this coverage dropped off after sort of the, you know, flash boom bang of the murder. Nobody really followed it through to the trial. So we latched on and we, we sat through every day of the six week trial and, and have the full coverage for you. Now, Chuck, you were talking about old time radio. Mm-hmm. And it's not old time radio, but there is, there's a hint of that. And I'll tell you why. When I listened to the episode, and you guys can correct me on the details, but it was, you were talking about a firefighter and you're talking about how the firefighter went into the structure. It was still smoke filled. He knew his oxygen tank only had 15 or 20 minutes worth of time on it. He was doing a technique called a right hand where he was holding his hand along the right side of the wall trying to find his way. So do you see what I'm saying, Chuck, where it had yeah. that, it has that level of detail. You get in the mind of, of yes. the person that's going through the experience. Yes. Yeah. So it, for me, I was able, when I was listening to it, it was like you could switch into the minds of these different people that you were hearing described. Because mm-hmm. all of a sudden you're envisioning this firefighter, you know, crawling down a hallway, rubbing, you know, with his hand along the wall in a smoke filled area where he can't see anything. And knowing that, he has this limited number of minutes on his tank. There's, uh, we just don't get that kind of stuff anymore. And even television doesn't do that because television would do that in video. And oftentimes we wouldn't even think about it. It wouldn't even be something we would think about, you know, well, what's this firefighter thinking and, and what the experience, the, the hearing the experience this way, I think in this particular case is better than if this was a video documentary. Because, yeah, if you're watching a TV show, you're seeing it from the outside, but this sort of puts you like you are the firefighter. You are doing that right-hand search and what you find. We actually have the, the words of one of the family's daughters and how she experienced walking into her childhood home that had been, you know, basically burned up and seeing all of these places where she had memories and going and looking for, you know, a scarf in her mother's drawer to see if it still smelled like her. 
I mean, it's, it's very perspective oh driven. So sad. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's so, really, it's a tough thing to do and it's a tough thing to work on, you know, and present it. Obviously, we're trying to do our best to present it respectfully, but these details sensitively are too. Difficult. I mean, yeah. it would be very difficult. Yeah. So and that, that, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jack. Oh, and that's one of the things, you know, normally as journalists, we are almost always behind the scenes. It's not really about what we think or what we're seeing. It's, you know, we're putting it out there for other people. But I think because we have spent so much time with this that we, um, you know, kind of our understanding, our grappling with this kind of becomes a part of the podcast. It's not the main element, but kind of we're people too. And so, um, you know, during the trial, when, when they were doing some of the really difficult days when the medical examiner is testifying in really graphic detail about, you know, kind of the really horrific injuries that these people suffered, we, um, we recorded our, our conversations um, during the coverage of the trial, you know, just to kind of keep an audio diary. Mm-hmm. And, and it was, you know, and Megan was there in the courtroom and it was really difficult. And that's something that, you know, I think as journalists, we were used to dealing with difficult topics and you kind of move on. And when we went back and listened to these tapes, we kind of almost forgot what we were thinking and experiencing at that time. And it was, you know, it, it was difficult. So I think the podcast format allows us to kind of, you know, where it makes sense to show our, our grappling with this story and how to do it sensitively. Now, what kind of stories, Megan and Jack, what kind of stories are you guys normally working on? This is unusual for you. Slightly. I, I'm usually, I usually cover crime and courts for uh, WTOP. It's a news radio station here in D.C. So I, usually this is my beat. And I'll so you're cover, a crime reporter. I am, yeah. I cover crime and I cover courts, essentially. I mean, you just kind of hopefully to follow it through, follow the storyline through and see what happens. But very rarely do you spend this amount of time on, on anything anymore. I mean, kind of to Mark's point, it's, it's like the next day, the next story. Um, so to be able to follow this through, it does give you a sort of responsibility to tell it right. Well, why did you decide to follow this through in the beginning? I mean, it's not something you would normally do. I mean, I, I think we chose to follow it through in a different way. We knew that the case was going to be, um, I mean, first of all, it was captivating to a lot of our listeners. But beyond that, there was a lot of mystery around this one, especially I, I spoke already about that there could have been another suspect, but we didn't know what um, the, the killer, Darren Wint, we didn't know what his defense was going to be until the first day of the trial when he drops a bombshell and accuses his brothers of taking part in this murder. So not only do you have sort of, you know, the, the victim's family and their extended family going through this loss and breakdown, but the suspect's family is also going through this tumultuous time because you know, he's blaming his brothers for doing this and saying, I had nothing to do with it. So as it sort of kept unraveling, it was like there were so many details we didn't get to report just given the daily news cycle. And there was so much drama to it. It felt like it was something that needed more time just right out of the gate. Now, were his brothers ever investigated or ever charged at all? They were never charged. They were investigated, um, but not necessarily. I mean, they were investigated by um, the lawyers, but police never found anything that would really rise to the level of investigation. I mean, you have to have something to start looking into somebody's life. You can't just say, oh, you're accused. Let me, you know, pull your bank records. Um, well, actually, they do that in Congress now. <laughs> but, <laughs> Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah, that does actually happen now in D.C. <laughs> yeah, and that was one of the fascinating things about this case. Um, for One thing, so when the crime happened to when the trial happened, there was some somewhat of an unusual gap. It was three years. So, you know, when we were waiting for the trial to happen, you know, and attention kind of dried up. And we didn't really hear any details of the case until the trial happened. And that's when he dropped this bombshell, naming his brothers as these alternative suspects in the case. In the prosecution, to be clear, they said, you know, that was complete bogus. There was no evidence the brothers had done this. They were completely innocent. But it did require us to consider the defense's theory, you know, trying to be objective journalists. We sat through the trial. We, we thought, well, is there, could this be... Um, so we, we kept an open mind throughout the trial. Um, and I think one of the things, I think this really kind of presented the justice system, you know, perhaps at its best, because I think the, both of the attorneys were highly qualified, very skillful. 
I don't really think you could say he didn't get a fair defense. His defense lawyer was was tenacious and the prosecution was as well. The judge was very fair. So there's kind of a, a civics lesson aspect to this too, to kind of show the justice system up close and personal with this highly unusual case, but where, you know, to our minds, it was, you know, the way that it should be. Blue Eating You works fast and you won't stink. This episode of Blunt Force Truth is brought to you by Blue Emu Pain Relief Products. Now, I've been in show business for many years now, and I'm not slowing down, but I can use a little help every now and then. Blue Emu's family of products are made in America and have become a staple in my life. The deep penetrating formula of Blue Emu Original is best for supporting my muscles and joints, and I'm sure you've seen it. It's on the shelf in a blue and white jar. I also use Maximum Arthritis for any arthritic pain and the lidocaine cream for numbing pain relief. Not only do these Blue Emu formulas work great, there's no chill, no burn, and no odor. Blue Emu, it works fast and you won't stink. Now these people were, if I'm understanding this right, these people were held hostage for like 19 hours, right? We ended up being 22. <laughs> Wikipedia is 19. Uh, <laughs> but if, and what's well, that's one of the never gets it right. Exactly. <laughs> and that's one of those details that when the, crime, when the crime first happened, it, it turned out to be in, incorrect the way people first understood um, the timeline of the crime to happen, which we didn't learn until the trial. So and, some, and did they torture their son in front of them during this time? The son was in a separate, held in a, well, he was found in a separate bedroom. So the, the tricky part is we don't know what happened to that house. I mean, everything's silent in that house, except for the fact that during the time they're being held, they, well, the mother and the father, Sava and Amy, both make calls out of the house. And almost everybody who receives those calls says they sound completely normal. Family members, you know, maintenance guys, um, a pet resort they had a, a reservation at. And, and it's just, you got to think, gosh, how could you possibly have kept it together? Boy, no kidding. Or, you know, if, if you're... So they actually circumstances. made phone calls during the time they were held hostage. They, and we have a couple of those voicemails that they left for people. And it does. It sounds... I mean, I didn't know them, obviously, but it doesn't sound like they're under duress. Do you know um, why they would do something like this and why no, they were allowed to do something like this? Well, the prosecution said they're trying to keep, you know, keep everything as normal as they can possibly make it sound to save their child. You would do anything that you can to get out of there safely and get your son out of there safely. And what we know is he was found in a separate bedroom and we know all of them were tortured. I mean, you kind of don't want your mind to go there that they used him against the parents, but it's hard. I mean, a lot of this, you know, you don't want to get into speculation, but to do what he did to a 10 year old is what the prosecution said is just, it just takes your breath away. It's unbelievable. And this was to get, and this was to get money and, and, so where did the cash come from? How did they get the money? So that's one of the that's one of the phone calls or a series of phone calls that were that were made was to uh, Mr. Savopoulos's business. Um, he was the CEO of a construction company um, in the D.C. area, and they uh, he made a series of calls to the chief financial officer, the controller of the company, his assistant, and forty thousand dollars was withdrawn from the from the uh, uh, a checking account of American Ironworks, the company that he ran, and was then delivered by his assistant to the house. Um, and it didn't really seem to raise any eyebrows. And there was there's a re there's reasoning for that. And after the fact, people said, well, you know, maybe it seemed a little strange, but at the time, you know, it he was a high powered CEO who was you know, frequently spending thousands on this kind of really um, specialized equipment. So that, the, you know, they thought that's what the money was for. And yeah, they, he'd go to auctions and buy specialized equipment. And when we're talking about, you know, welding equipment and stuff on that scale, it can cost, up, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. So he, I think he picked a number. I mean, who knows how much the, the perpetrator wanted to get out of him. But it seemed like, at least to me, when I sat through trial, it seemed like that Sava Savovlis picked a number that would not raise eyebrows, right? Same as those phone calls so that he could kind of see if he could get through this alive. And one, if I could say one of the things that I think people may remember from when this first happened um, is one of the calls while the family was being held, one of the calls made was to Domino's Pizza to have two pizzas delivered to the house. They believe this was made, you know, the kidnapper forced the family to make the call to Domino's Pizza. And that, um, and he was hungry, I guess. And, 
that pizza turned out to be crucial evidence because when when the fire happened, the whole house didn't burn down. It, the fire was pretty much um, uh, kept to the upstairs, two upstairs bedrooms, but they found in a corner of the room those two boxes of pizza, and inside there was a pizza crust, and when they swabbed it for DNA, they found his DNA on the pizza crust. So that's how they found him. Wow. So... <clears throat> And and what's striking me about the $40,000, Chuck, is nowadays most banks don't even keep that much cash. Mm -hmm. It's true. They had to call a couple banks to to find the one. Ah, see, that makes sense to me because in businesses I've run, I've sometimes done that exact same thing. I'm going to go buy a car and I'm going to pay cash for it. Go get me some cash. So I could see this working, but that's why I was about to ask you, did they have to go to more than one bank to be able to collect that amount of money? Yeah, and, and, and the whole thing is interesting. You have, not only do you have um, what we know about the calls made, but then you have the sort of the other players in this, the assistant who dropped off the cash, who police initially thought was a suspect in this because obviously he's dropping off cash at the house that burned down a couple hours later. But we have, you know, cell phone pings now have changed how police investigate crimes. So you can see his phone pinging where he says he was, you know, he was during this time and it all lines up and We have, you know, one of the victim's cell phones out of the house down in DuPont Circle, if you're familiar with D.C., Mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the city during the time he's being held hostage. So, obviously, it's not him. So, there's also these, you know, these these timeline points where you're like, well, how did that happen? And we we kind of lay it out chronologically. Yeah, that's really weird to have somebody's cell phone pinging in the center of the city and they're not even there. Right. So, maybe the, you know, maybe the killer took it with them or somebody, I mean, you know. It just raises these questions. And, and part of the podcast, too, is us as journalists going through and being like, well, maybe, but it just doesn't make sense based on this fa- these facts. We should tell you, too, there's an interesting um, sidebar to this is in D.C., there is no audio or video recording in court. And we learned during the, the course of this trial that for the stenographers, they are, you know, they're typing live, but they have an audio recording of what's happening in court so they can go back if they miss something or missed a word and fill it in. Well, we FOIA'd those, uh, the, you know, the audio because wow. that would help us. <laughs> well, no. So they said, well, it's not the record. It's not the official record. The official record is the written stenographers, you know, typing right. uh, the transcripts. And so we found a Supreme Court decision that challenges that. And we wrote the chief justice of the Superior Court here in D.C., who was appointed by the president, by the way, and said, hey, you know, we want to challenge this. We think that if there is a public record of what happened in a public space, you know, mm-hmm. that we, should have, we should have access to it. And, and they have launched a review. They're, they have a working group here in D.C. that's considering our request to have the audio released. And if that happens, that changes how news is covered in, in the District of Columbia. Now, the, the murder in this case, was, was he armed when he, how did he get in this house and how did he control these people? I mean, was he armed? Was he a big guy? Was the homeowner not a big guy? What was, how did he do that? Well, so, and these are great questions. These are all questions that we had when this first happened. And then, you know, there was radio silence for three years before the trial. And these questions began to be answered at the trial. So, um, the, the suspect in the case, the, the man who's now been convicted, um, Darren Wint, was a, um, a, a, not a very large man, but he um, was going to the gym very frequently at that point in time. He was very muscular. So it would not have been necessarily all that difficult for him to overpower any single one of the people. Although when, you, when you're talking about all four together, I mean, keeping in mind one is a 10-year-old child, but that, that did present a, a question of kind of logistics of how could one person do this. Um, the way that- who's the, th- who's the third person? You have the mother, the father, the 10-year-old, and well, the- the, the third person is Vera Alicia Figueroa, and she was the housekeeper who actually was supposed to leave that day at three o'clock and, and never got the chance to. But I mean, essentially, it, it kind of, you know, is part of the reveal during the podcast, but there is a big question and, and they never really answered exactly how he got into the house. We spoke with another housekeeper who worked there for 20 years and they were presenting the crime scene photos during trial and she saw something in those photos that nobody else saw. And she couldn't speculate about it on the stand, but she tells us how she thinks he got in the house. So let me ask you something that seems just incredible to me. I know that you said that there's no video or audio around the city of Washington. Well, no, in inside the courts. In the courts. <clears throat> okay, so just inside courts, the courts. 
Yeah, but there's a court where you can have, you know, there's a, the judge can decide, yeah, we're going to do video on this one or we're not, or, you know, depending. I used to work in Kansas City and they had that in some courts, but here in D.C., it's an, an absolute no-go. Well, my, my question is, this guy's living, you know, large and a f- over four million plus house with a $700,000 car in his garage and he has no video? Uh, for, no security cameras on his own no house? security cameras anywhere? He does have security cameras, oh. but it was a, it's, I'm smiling when you ask this question because you guys are getting to learn all of the things that we want to know for three years. You get them to learn like that. <laughs> um, well, Ed, cameras. Mark was an ex-cop. I'm just a guy. <laughs> I'm just a host. You're just asking all the questions that everybody wants to know. Yeah. Um, basically, there was a security system. They hadn't fully enabled it that day. They didn't arm it. So a few months before, maybe two months before, they had switched security companies and they had a new, you know, new system installed and they were kind of just still testing it out, you know, and they had like a, a, um, a glass break detector that was supposed to alert on the sound of Mm -hmm. breaking glass, but it was really hypersensitive. So if you like dropped keys on the counter, it would go off. So they were like sometimes not turning on the system. I mean, in kind of the portrait that emerges is really how tragically, um, trusting they were i mean they just from everything we know they were such great people and they just i don't think they could understand how um how bad people can be that there's really evil in this world yeah i mean there was a video and and the um so there so there was a video because my understanding is the video runs all the time right my video cameras are always on even if the alarm's not armed that's because you're you're rightfully paranoid that's a good thing to have (laughs) no i'm they had is rightfully paranoid i will (laughs) they have they had a motion detecting uh, like so uh, it triggered the camera triggered on if there was motion um Mm -hmm. but that that the no, I, I keep stepping over my words, words. I apologize. Darren went, went up. It was stored in house. So it was on a server in the house. And so he pulled it out and, and took it out and, and they never found it. I mean, there's no video evidence of him at that house. Had he had ever been to that house in the past before that day? Not that we know of. No. One of the things they were able to pull his, um, almost every search that he'd ever done on his phone, you know, anytime you like go to your phone and type something in, you're looking something up an address, directions, or anything, they were able to pull all of that information from his phone. There was never a search for that house, that address, the family. So that's one of those mysteries of, wow. we don't really know. He did work for the, the construction company, uh, but that was 10 years before the murders. And oh, wow. We, so and we he knew this family if he worked for the construction company. But 10 years ago, I mean... Yeah. Well, yeah. Who would hold a grudge for 10 years? And we don't really know. I mean, he had very little, if any, interaction with, with uh, Sava Savopoulos. No interaction ever with the family. I mean, Philip was 10, right? So he never even met Philip. If you, if but he, he knew fired. them. I mean, he obviously knew them and knew that they, when I say knew them, he knew of them. <clears throat> yeah, he but knew he, of them. He did. But the motive there is just like, like Mark said, it's like, why would you wait 10 years? It just doesn't, for me at least personally, that's the part I've really struggled with because it doesn't hold up for me. Well, you- never, never did a search about alarm systems, never did a search about where their house was located. No, no Google Earth images of the, the, the property. No. So there, and there are some incriminating searches after the fact. Um, so after the killings, his first search um, was how to beat a lie detector test or um, top, uh, top U.S. city, top U.S. cities for fugitives in countries with no extradition treaty. But those ones are kind of telling. (laughs) (laughs) But those are all after the fact, you know, before when we're trying to understand, you know, why. Right. Did he plan this? Did he have any weapons? But all these things that we kind of can't really tell. I mean, the the weapons that were used against the family were all in that house, as far as we can tell. So they were like kitchen knives, things like that. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't shot. I mean, he didn't, I mean, he may, he may have brought a gun and left with a gun and we never, you know, never heard about it. But let, let me ask you this. There. Were these people killed before the house was set on fire? Do they know? We think that the, it's hard, it's a hard question to answer. Were they consumed by the, the flames or their bodies consumed by the flames or were they not? The medical examiner found that the adults were most likely dead before the fire. The 10-year-old possibly could have died in part because of the fire and because of his injuries. So he may have still been breathing because there was, you know, there was ash in his lungs. So he may have still been alive. I mean, it's a horrible thing to think about. It is horrible. This is one of those things 
like 9-11. And, when, and the reason I'm equating it to that, Chuck, it's, it's one of those events that you don't want to believe can happen in the world. It's one of those things that, okay, bad things happen and sometimes people are victims and they did nothing to become a victim. And sometimes you can't prevent evil from doing things. I mean, it's, it's a horrific story. Do you guys, did the two of you, do you think that this guy personally, do you think this guy acted alone? So I, I, um, yeah, as I said, I kept an open mind throughout the whole trial. I considered his, his defense, but I found, but personally I, saw all the evidence and I think I would have came to the same conclusion as, as the jurors. And I think that with that in mind, I don't know who, if there were other people involved, who would he be protecting at this point? You know, so it, for me, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make logical sense given that I believe he tried to falsely accuse his two brothers of doing the crime. Who, who at this point would he be trying to protect? And I think the prosecution did lay out um, for the jurors, a way that one person who, for lack of a better term, got lucky in committing this, the you know this these horrific acts, would would be able to carry out this nightmare. We thought for a while, you know, there was three years between the crime and the trial, so we thought for a while that during the time he's, you know, police aren't finding new suspects, no DNA is coming up. Is he going to flip on somebody? Was he hired to do this? You know, was there somebody else in his life? Right. You just you're kind of waiting. And that never came to be. And I thought it was an interesting thing. And the prosecution in the closing argument said, you know, just because even if you think there were more than one, was more than one person who took part in this, if you think he took part in it, you can convict. We'll get the other people if there's, you know, if there comes an opportunity to get to get the other people. But right now, we're not asking you, did multiple people take part of this? We're asking you, did Darren Wint do this? And they decided yes. Reminds me a little bit, Chuck, of, of somebody who I knew who was actually a terrific person. That was John Ramsey. Yes. When John's daughter was murdered. And uh, it was one of those things that no one could really figure out. Why did that happen? Yeah. yeah. So uh, here's my question to, to both of you. How did doing this type of reporting in this story change you? Has, has, this, has this changed your view of reporting? Has it changed your view of crime? Has it changed your view of society? How has it affected you? That's a big question. I think it's changed my reporting a lot. I mean, I'm used to filing 40 second reports three times a day. I mean, this is, this is absolutely as far away as you can get from that. It feels like we're putting together a documentary and it feels like you're getting to really tell the full story in the best way you can, in the most respectful and, you know, in sincere way you can and, and let out all the facts and not pick and choose what you think editorially is going to be the strongest to present, you know? I mean, I think we've both found different voices. It's funny, I'm a broadcast reporter. Jack is a print reporter. So combining those two talents can sometimes be <laughs> a mm -hmm. little challenging mm -hmm. um, just because you write differently and you think differently. He's a detail guy. I'm a big picture girl. So it's, it's been, it really has been a, a, a massive project that we have put our heart and souls into. So it's definitely changed, I think, the course of our careers and, and hopefully it will be successful. But it's totally changed how I've reported for sure. Jack, how's it changed you? I think, um, you know, kind of, I don't know if this is the most significant thing, but one of the things that I've noticed um, as we are, you know, going back to the very beginning of this case and looking at every single detail that's ever been reported and everything we learned at the trial, and it, it really has given me a sense of um, humility because I realize, you know, every day, when we're reporting a story and we're trying to be accurate, we're trying to get them, you know, as much as we can. And when I read some of the initial stories from other media outlets, even, you know, from some of our initial stories and what we're learning from police and maybe the details are, are all accurate, although sometimes that's not exactly the case, but our understanding is very different now. So I, I think it's, it's given me a, a sense of humility about, you know, every day when, you, when you're trying to go out and get the story, you know, even just that much being that much more purposeful about, you know, what you do know, what you don't know, don't say anything more than, than what you can say, you know, to be as accurate as possible. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. And context is a, is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so, so it's made you more cautious or careful when you're doing the day-to-day -day reporting? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Has it made you more skeptical about 
what you might see on TV reported? Does it make you ask the question, I wonder if they got all the facts correct or things of that nature? Um, perhaps that. And also just this idea of even if all the facts are correct, it, it also the kind of the frame in which they're in could totally change your understanding of those facts. So it's kind of given me that, um, that perspective. You know, one of the things, this idea of there having to have been more than one person carrying out this crime, one of the, one of the th- elements that kind of really fed speculation is when Darren Went was arrested in this case, he was with um, four other people, five other people. And people, you know, from the outside were saying, well, they must have known, they must have been involved too. Like, why would four other people be with a, you know, quadruple murderer? You know, there's no way they're not involved. And really what we learned at the trial is they weren't involved. And some of them really happened to be, I mean, it's an incredible story. And they just really happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. They had no idea they were in the car with a guy who had killed four people. I mean, it's really incredible, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that it took us three years in this exceedingly complex trial to learn that. And none of the facts were wrong. It was just the way that, you know, the way that you think about it. Yeah. Yeah, It's some things aren't always as they look. And and we also learned too, you want things to fit. You know, I think it's human nature that you want Mm -hmm. things to make sense and the timeline to make sense. And, you know, why did Amy go for a walk to Starbucks in the middle of this whole thing? Why wouldn't she walk to the closest Starbucks? Why did she? And there's like all these things that just don't really. What did you just say? What? (laughs) Well, so in the middle of, before this whole thing starts, there was a neighbor who saw Amy Savolis. Before it starts. Before they're taken hostage, before the two, um, Sava and Amy are taken hostage. They, a, a neighbor sees her walking and there's all of this, Que- there's all of these questions around was it her why was she walking that far in the middle of the day was she why was she dressed up why would she have changed from what we saw her in earlier on surveillance video when she took her son to the doctor's office i mean there's just my point is is you got to let go of some of the details that don't add up and look at the big picture and and what it really led to i mean i got caught up on what a woman you know why would you change purses in the middle of the day that doesn't seem like it's something that someone would do but there's just so many little details in this thing that you want to fit and I think as reporters and, and as just as, hum, as human nature, you want things to have a narrative and to make sense and have a story. And just like what Jack was saying, I mean, things look a certain way. That doesn't necessarily mean how, that's how they are. Yeah, it's human nature to always want things to fit in order and have a conclusion because as humans, we repel, we, we don't like randomness. Mm-hmm. And we don't like to think that random bad things can even happen to us. We want it. We want reasons. We want excuses. We want... We want an explanation. Chuck, you were about to say something. So. Well, I was wondering about this guy, Went. Is that his name? Yeah, Darren Went. Darren Went. What's his background? What, what, did we, what do we know about him? And you would think what he has he, to be a total sociopath to be able to do Where did he come that. from? What, did he have a rap sheet? Was he, you know, a bad guy before? Yeah, so he, he did have a rap sheet. Um, for nothing like this. Um, there were mostly traffic offenses, although there were um, some assault convictions. And um, he, I guess you could say he had a temper because he had several uh, protective orders taken out against him, including by his, his own family at one point. But again, that was years before before the these killings. Um, from his background, we know he, he immigrated to the U.S. in 2000 from Guyana in South America. Um, with his family, he had a large family here um, who by all accounts were, you know, productive, middle-class uh, people. You know, they, they didn't have rap sheets. They didn't have criminal backgrounds. He was really seemed to be an outlier. Um, and that was what kind of made the, when he tried to blame his brothers during the trial, kind of that much more wrenching is um, when, we, when we talk about, you know, another family being affected by this. Um, was there, do you know if there was any use prior to this incident by him of any type of uh, psych meds or any type of, you know, change in substances or anything, you know, with him? We didn't have, history. yeah, we didn't get a medical history, which is I found sort of interesting during the trial. But what Jack was saying to me the other day was, you know, how relatively normal he was. You know, he's not sitting in his basement, you know, looking up, you know, how to make bombs on the internet or something. He was like going to the gym. He's looking for work every day. He's, 
hanging out with his family. I mean, it wasn't like he was not social or he wasn't, I mean, he, he had an, a fiance in New York who he'd go up and visit every once in a while. So obviously something happened. Right. So the guy's not right. He's not in a cabin writing a manifesto. He seems, seems well, like right. a normal person. I mean, he, he's under duress. I mean, he, he, he didn't have a, a, normal pla- a normal place to live. He's living with his family who weren't really happy about that and they wanted him to move out. He couldn't keep work. He was, he was a welder, but he couldn't find a steady job. He had one, you know, back 10 years ago, but it, he was sort of in this patch of being unemployed and he needed money. I mean, he needed money to, to stay in the country because his green card was about to expire. I mean, there's a lot of things. He wanted to buy a, a ring for his fiance, but does that, does that give you enough motive to kill four people? I mean, it's just, yeah. there's huge gaps in, in the motive and, they, and the prosecution said that. I mean, even while they were able to prove he did it, they, they basically said he wanted the American dream. He wanted to have what the Savopolis family had, and he was going to take it. Well, the program is called 24 Hours, An American Nightmare. It's going to come out on uh, June 10th. It'll be available at Podcast One. I'm assuming it'll be available on iTunes also. Yep, it's on Apple Podcasts and, you know, all, all the places you find your podcasts. I have to tell you, it's 22 hours. 22. 22 Hours, An American Nightmare. That's right, yes. And what's next uh, after this? What's next for, for you two? Well, we're still in the middle of this thing. We, um, we're hoping to, to continue to, to, you know, hear from more people and add more um, witnesses and, and sources into the podcast and really make it as good as it can be. And there's also a web element. There's a lot of supplemental content, maps and photos from the crime scene and all sorts of stuff you can find online as well. So this is our baby right now. We don't quite know what's next. Well, terrific. Well, folks, if you go to bluntforcetruth.com, go to the show notes, and the show notes will be listed as 22 Hours, an American Nightmare. Go through the show notes. You will find links to the podcast uh, and links to the website where you can see the maps and the diagrams and everything that they have included. And uh, it sounds like a great show. I, I am going to be listening to this. Me too. I can't wait to hear it. Great. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate you having us on. <clears throat> Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, everybody, for listening today. We hope you'll tune them in. And uh, we're glad you tuned us in. Thank you. And we'll see you next time.